for being with us here today. Um, we're, we'll also be recording this meeting, so if you need to leave or for people who weren't able to make it, um, they'll be able to, to watch the meeting and just ask the, the speakers to, to do your best to stay on time so that we can keep on schedule today. Um, so, yeah, so for our, our first remarks, we have uh, Gerhard Kusko, who's the executive director of Maracus. And just let me know when you want the slides to change, Gerhard. Thank you, Matt. There's not that many of them. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, for organizing this, for spending the time to get everyone together. It's, uh, it's nice to see each other and nice to see everyone, even though we're not in person. But I look forward to uh, seeing everyone later this year and to 2024 being a very exciting year. So right up front, um, faces to names. Uh, Mary Ford, who, who's on the call, is our deputy director, and Mike Crowley, our technical director, who also sits at Rutgers University, uh, and myself make up the core management team. But we work uh, closely with folks all throughout the region, some of you, uh, and obviously with Matt and Kim. So Maracuse, as many of you know, but in case there's some folks that haven't heard this in a while or, or might not come in contact with IUS that often, uh, we serve as a non-federal component to the larger public-private partnership that is the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System, a system that was put into law uh, 15 years ago uh, and has been reauthorized since then and has grown tremendously through not just the 17 federal agencies led by NOAA, but also by the folks on the front line like yourselves that make up the, re the 11 certified regional associations, two of which you'll hear from today, uh, Jackie and Jake uh, following uh, me. We collect data in its most, in, in our most simplest form, we collect and, and provide quality assured or quality controlled data, uh, but not just the, the stuff that we might have collect through our partners itself, uh, but also leverage through others and other funding sources to ensure that it gets maximum exposure, maximum use, because everything we do is based on societal benefits, as you may know. And the stakeholders in the region, the mid-Atlantic region, from about Cape Cod to Cape Hatteras, uh, are what drives the research, drives the funding. Now, uh, in addition to collecting data, uh, leveraging other data, doing data management and making those data available through, through a variety of mechanisms, both machine to machine and a variety of, 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 of pathways. We also have a portal, Oceans Map. We can go to the next page, actually. We have a, 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 a portal, uh, a, a brief picture of Maracuse Oceans Map is on the right of the screen. On the left, you'll see sort of a, a wheel of, of engagement because everything, as I, I mentioned, uh, really comes back to what the stakeholders need and how we can use to apply uh, the data and the model outputs uh, and predictions. Uh, and, and the world of acoustic telemetry uh, only continues to grow in importance as new uh, uh, uses and new um, potential conflicts appear, uh, wind energy being obviously a major shift in how we use our offshore areas and the impacts they'll have not just on living marine resources, but on habitat, and other users. Uh, so uh, acoustic telemetry and marrying biological data with physical oceanographic data uh, and, and, and other types of data is an important part of evolving the decision-making process, not just the planning for some of this, but how we respond and, and, and how we uh, are able to monitor the impacts uh, on the environment over the course of you know 30 years that some of these, uh, these, these sites will be up uh, in, in in our regions here on the East Coast. Um, I will say, uh, if you go to the last slide, um, we are interested in data from all sorts of platforms and all sorts of, uh, uh, of, the, um, of, of partners. Um, we um, obviously are limited, like everyone else is, by resources. Uh, we have, as I, though I mentioned, we've grown tremendously in the last decade or so. We'll be uh, celebrating our 20th anniversary in May this year, and we will uh, extend an invitation uh, to all of you to join us in Washington, D.C. in late May. 
uh, and I'll make sure that, that 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 Matt and Kim have the information to pass out to the wider uh, network. But it'll be a great opportunity to bring us together with policymakers and 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 funding authorities to hammer home some of the important messages uh, uh, that, that and 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 stories that they need to hear. I mean, it's great we talk to ourselves, we try to get out to the communities, but sometimes. You know, we need to spend just that five or 10 minutes getting into a policymaker's ear and letting them know the impacts that the work you do are having for the future of, of, of our region and, and our environment, ecosystem, and resources. Um, so there's a lot we'd love to do to get more uh, acoustic arrays into the region, to be able to access those data, to find ways to make it comfortable or, or safe uh, uh, for, for researchers to share data, not feel compromised, but to get maximum impact and use of those data uh, for things like habitat modeling, for decision-making, whether it's regulatory or for, uh, uh, for commercial or private use. Uh, that's some of the things we'd like to work on with this community. Those are some of the things that we think will have a huge impact and will uh, enable our ability to drive funding up uh, and, and and increase your ability to do the work you're doing. So thanks very much for having us. We're very excited to, to continue to be involved, not just as a vehicle to pass funding through to uh, ACT Matos uh, for the important work, but really to try to partner and find ways to elevate and grow the network uh, into the future. Thanks very much. Happy to be here and wishing us a great meeting today. Great. Thanks, Gerhard. Our... Uh, next welcome comes from Jackie at Niracus. Hi, good morning, everybody. And uh, Matt, thank you for inviting me. I believe that this is my first meeting with all of you. So thanks for having me. And Gerhard, thanks for painting a, a, a great picture of IUS. Um, it'll certainly dovetails well with the slides I put together. Um, and so my remarks will be relatively short. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, so to give a little bit of understanding of our core observing system, as we like to think of it, these are our sustained observations. Um, I've included here a map of what we think of as the, the Naracoot Northeast region um, throughout the Gulf of Maine and Long Island Sound, where, of course, we overlap with Maracoot. Um, and as Gerhard was saying, our observing system is really driven by stakeholder needs. There's a wide array of stakeholders. Um, foundational to our system in the Northeast are the, the buoy network throughout Long Island Sound and Gulf of Maine. Um, I believe we have something, we support, I think about 13 moorings, something like that, um, that collect surface and subsurface observations. I believe some of these have receivers, but they're a really great platform of opportunity where there's lots of, um, um, opportunities to put other sensors and detections or, or what have you. So I just wanted to make sure I called that out. Um, we support a number of other kind of monitoring and models. Um, and as Gerhard said, we have a certified data management system, which integrates the data and information that we collect on physical and biogeochemical observations and biological variables, but also those of our partners. Um, and when we, to integrate partner data, this is really once again driven by um, those needs that have identified and by stakeholders coming to us um, to help prioritize certain variables. And to make all of this information available, we then work to build products and integrate this available so that it is easier to understand or to um, ascertain trends. Um, next slide, please. Uh, for today, I thought I'd just kind of highlight some really exciting upcoming work that we have um, in data management and products. Um, so for, I think over two, we have over two decade time series information available, um, for the, for the, for a lot of the mooring. Um, and in the next couple of years, we will be working to think about how we can better visualize and integrate data sets across these various data, um, data sets. So, um, how does this oceanographic data biological or integrate with biological information? Um, specifically passive acoustics. Um, here you can see, I, I just pulled out kind of some of the information we can pull from passive acoustic information. How can we identify other pieces of um, <clears throat> maybe uh, of the ecosystem from 
information and data sets like this? And how do we integrate it then into the, the physical oceanographic data that we have? Um, we'll also be working on this with plankton. Um, you can see here, I have a screenshot of um, a plankton data that we have in our ERDAP. So it's available for anybody to access as well as computer to computer. Um, and also beyond that, how do we think about eDNA? How does this all relate? So I brought all this forward. And of course, how does this all relate to telemetry? And I think that this is really reinforced by the point that Gerhard had made of this is all one system and how can we better pull information together to understand um, and, and and um, and think of the system more holistically. Um, so that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, concerns, please feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Jackie. Next, we have uh, Toby Curtis, who is uh, representing the U.S. Animal Telemetry Network. Thanks, Matt. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here again. Um, the uh, I'm, I'm pitch hitting today for Michelle Lander and Megan McKenzie. Um, as you recall, uh, some of you may recall, I, I was the acting ATN coordinator on, on detail last year. Uh, since um, I've more recently rotated back to my day job at NOAA Fisheries in the Highly Migratory Species Management Division. Um, but I'm still trying to help out Michelle and Megan um, as I can during this interim phase. Um, but they send their best. and um, We'll have contact info for them uh, a little bit later on. So next slide, Matt. So um, as, as we're all very familiar, um, telemetry is, is a very powerful and adaptable tool. It's being used um, you know, to, to address a lot of questions and a lot of applications. And ATN is really about trying to bring, you know, bring those applications together, um, providing uh, data products and services to uh, to the telemetry user community, but also to end users and, and policymakers. And, um, and so uh, having Gerhard and, and, uh, and Jackie here uh, today is great. They, they provided a, a really fantastic backdrop um, and, and uh, trying to tee up the, the sort of impact that your individual projects can have. I think this community act in particular, you're really you know, on the cutting edge and really moving the science forward in this space. And I'd encourage everyone to you know, to reach out to, to ATN, reach out to Maracus and Maracus folks if, if, there, if they have questions about how they could better maximize the impact um, of their data. So um, thank you, Matt. Um, so yeah, next slide is fine. Thanks. So, um, so just in terms of sort of an update um, for ATN, where we're at, um, obviously we're continuing to, to invest in, in uh, telemetry efforts. Uh, and we're, we're proud to continue to partner with ACT and support it and encourage and sort of coordinate with our regional associations, especially Naracus and Maracus uh, for ACT. And so there's been ongoing discussions uh, across the country with all the regions um, working to support and build out their regional acoustic networks. Um, as uh, many of you may have heard, IUS is in the process of hiring a permanent marine life ATN coordinator that will sit in the, in the marine life program at IUS. Uh, th this position uh, basically permanently backfills Bill Woodward, who retired uh, a couple of years ago now. And so we're looking forward to moving out of this sort of interim phase and having some sustained um, leadership and coordination at ATN. And I, I know IUS is excited to continue to support that effort. Um, so hopefully there'll be news on that front soon. Um, as I mentioned, supporting the regional acoustic nodes, and we want to focus on filling regional gaps with OTN and ATN compatible nodes. Uh, work towards leveraging existing infrastructure, we, you know, um, sort of like what Jackie mentioned, we want, there's cost effective ways to expand our uh, acoustic receiver um, arrays and, and coverage and, uh, you know, using other existing platforms. And so IUS is definitely uh, interested in prioritizing those kind of cost effective piggybacking type efforts. Um, we're working on advocating for expanded animal born ocean profiling. That's a little bit more in the Argo satellite tag space, but it's still kind of a, a um, again, a sort of a cost-effective way to, to leverage uh, animal tags to serve the broader IUS and ocean observing mission. And we're keeping, trying to keep ATN in the discussion uh, with new opportunities, funding opportunities, things like the Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act to, uh, to, to make, just be in the mix when we're talking about um, you know, new funding to address climate resilience, new blue economy, offshore wind is a biggie, of course. 
uh, marine life observation, data delivery, and, and the related needs. You know, as the use of telemetry is growing, it's and it continues to grow quite rapidly. There's a need um, for services like ACT um, and the other regions to to manage and deliver the data, um, and you know, and keep it secure and archived um, in, in appropriate ways. Um, and uh, along those same lines, we're, you know, working towards securing long-term investment support, both for ATN as well as all the, the regional uh, partners. So uh, that's all I have for, for sort of uh, welcome and updates. But thank you again um, for the invitation, Matt, to present. And uh, I'll be on for a little while, but feel free to reach out um, anytime. Next slide. There's just the, uh, the contact info for ATN um, and Meg. So um, best to everybody. I hope there's a lot, a lot of great things in store for 2024. And um, hopefully I'll see some of you out there on the water or, uh, or at other meetings. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Toby. Um, yeah, and I really appreciate the, these updates from, you know, from Toby and, and Maricus and, and Nericus so that you all can sort of uh, interact with a bit, uh, at least virtually, some of the, the regional and national coordinators who are um, helping to, to raise support uh, for the ACT Network and, and sort of our broader research efforts. Um, they've been really good supporters for us and uh, glad they're able to be here today. Um, so for the, the next section, we have uh, a series of brief updates about things going on in the ACT network. Um, so I'll I'll kind of kick it off. Um, again, if, if you haven't met me, I'm Matt Ogburn. I'm the network coordinator. Um, you'll be hearing from Kim Ritchie, who is our fearless data manager. And then uh, also briefly from Beth Bowers, who just joined our team in December as a postdoctoral fellow uh, who's working on a project to um, help increase the, the capacity that, that we have to uh, work with a lot of the, the different activities going on uh, related to acoustic telemetry and offshore wind in our region. And um, also to help uh, develop a national strategy for acoustic telemetry data with offshore wind. So she'll she'll tell you a bit more about that. Um, and yeah, so the 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 main update that I wanted to give is that um, we've especially with a lot of the activity going on with offshore wind. There's there's a lot of planning activities and um, strategy documents being written and and other things. And um, you know, we've been engaged in, in trying to provide the, the best information about what the ACT network is and what acoustic telemetry is and how that works, how our, our data, um, you know, sort of our, our system for securing and protecting your data works, how the data sharing system works and, and all of that. Um, one of the things that's become clear through that process is that there's still a good bit of legacy uh, text on some of our, our websites, both for the ACT network and for our Matos data portal. And uh, so we're in the process of, of updating that. So you'll see um, some of those things change a little bit, it's primarily just text edits at this point um, to, to try to you know, bring all of that up, information up to sort of the, the latest uh, status uh, so that the best information is out there and available for people who are looking for that. We're also in the process of uh, exploring doing a, a larger website upgrade. Um, our websites are, are both older legacy websites. And uh, so we'll, as that progresses, uh, you'll hear more about that. Um, but I created this slide um, to, to just help sort of clarify, hopefully, uh, some of the the, the different ways that um, that we sort of refer to the network and and tools like Matos uh, to to help clarify that a bit, and this is consistent with the language that we're adding to the websites. So um, I view the ACT network as us, our, our community of people working in this region who use acoustic telemetry and acoustic telemetry data and information in some way. We have our ACT Network database, which is uh, the, the database that um, Kim manages on the back end that stores all of our data and metadata from for projects, for tags, and for receiver deployments, and then the actual 
detection data themselves as well and uh, is able to, you know, that's all archived and, and QAQC'd and then um, shared during data pushes several times a year and uh, data are matched across all of the different projects. The our ACT network database um, that I was just referring to um, is an OTN compatible node uh, with an official name with an OTN of ACT underscore Matos. So you'll see that in your data downloads. Um, and it's also a regional database for the, the animal telemetry network um, that Toby was talking about. Um, and then finally, you know, Matos, um, which is a, a separate website currently, um, is the data portal that allows us to access the database either through uploading data or downloading data. Um, so just wanted to, to sort of give our, our the, the high level overview of, of how we sort of think about these things and, and how they relate to each other. I think uh, with that, I will hand it over to Kim. Matt. Um, yeah, so most of you probably have seen this slide already, um, but this is kind of the, the larger map, uh, full scale of the country in Canada that shows the different networks that we're connected to. So OTN in blue to our north, we're the, you know, mid midsection in sort of the green color um, covering Maine to North Carolina, and then our friends to the south, back. Um, and this just shows how we fit into that greater whole as Matt was talking about the connected nodes. Um, so the sort of zoomed in map is a current snapshot of all the you know active receivers we have in the water currently, uh, active within the last two years. And each of the different colors just represents um, you know, a different array that's managed by a different institution. So next slide, Matt. So the network currently has a thousand, just over a thousand active receivers, um, you know, over 2000 total. Some of the archive data is trickling in. In 2023, we had five glider missions um, that mostly came out of um, some Maracuse operations and Rutgers. Next slide. We are sitting at 147 projects. Um, and there's uh, 186 members. Uh, across a different 150 different institutions that federal, state, um, universities. And then we are sitting, we have 10 over 10,000 total tags, and almost 4,000 of those are currently active. So about 4,000 fish swimming around that I know about. Um, obviously, there's probably some more that we haven't quite captured in the database yet. And that's 68 different species, most of those being sturgeon uh, and striped bass, and then sharks and rays is kind of rounding out the, the top four. Next slide, Matt. Uh, this graph is just kind of showing our growth over, over time. Um, it's about the average of detections per year that we've pulled out. Um, so these are in millions. So you can see that we've been quite successful in getting data uploaded and matching fish. Uh, the match, match detections, so those are the known tag numbers. They're in blue, and then the unqualified detections that you might see in your extracts, are, they're in gray. So those are false detections or just tags that we haven't quite figured out who they belong to at this point. Next slide. Yeah, so we took a closer look into those unmatched detections. Uh, we wanted to know, are we capturing, you know, are these unmatched detections new tags coming in or are they more historical tags? So you can kind of see they parse out a little bit. So like the early years, 2014 to 2016, uh, we don't have a lot of projects in uh, for those current years. Oh, I saw someone mention these are, um, these are only pulled out for tag for unqualified detections that are greater than 80,000 um, as far as the projects go. So in 2014 to 2016, we're still working on getting a lot of historical data in. So there's only a few projects that are um, not matching to tags because we don't have a whole lot of tag projects in for the earlier years. And I know some of you are working on those. And then um, a middle, kind of the middle, range a little more recent 2018 to 2020 those are a couple projects 
um, in Delaware. So we know that there's a few tags out there that we're also working on getting in and have had some conversations with some of those PIs. So we look forward to sort of getting some of these numbers resolved as we start going now back to working on our historical data. And then in more recent years, you'll see that it's kind of a more even spread in 2022 and 2023. A lot of these arrays are cultural arrays. Um, and I imagine a lot of this has to do with some of the some of the stuff that's going on with offshore wind and the tags that are going in the water that you know they're not being shared or you know people aren't allowed to share based on their data agreements with their contracts. But some of the offshore wind stuff um, is what Beth is going to talk to us about. Next slide. Hi everybody, I'm Beth Bowers. I was brought on as a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian underneath Matt Ogburn to <clears throat> part, partly try to coordinate with offshore wind to motivate them to share some of these acoustic telemetry data that are coming in, mostly by explaining what the benefits are of belonging to our collaborative network. A lot of times we just accept that that's a thing, that we, we know that this expands our spatial study site by belonging to these collaborative networks, but um, it helps to make sure that that message is getting across to all uh, people that are using acoustic telemetry, and then that will only strengthen our um, our our uh, spatial study area as as a group. Um, so, if you could advance just the text on the slide. So, this is in support of the NOAA Fisheries and Boehm Federal Survey Mitigation Strategy, and part of it is to encourage that participation in the regional nodes, but also to develop a national strategy for acoustic telemetry is as it relates to offshore wind. So developing a best practices guide, what are the best um, the best steps moving forward in, in terms of using acoustic telemetry as a method for tracking and being able to hand that off to someone who uh, is a scientist, but maybe hasn't used that technology as extensively as we have. Kim, is it back to you? Um, so then just a few general updates. Um, we, in the past couple of years, we've funded three students to go to some local and international conferences. And we are kicking off the 2024 um, student awards. So that went live last night, hopefully. Um, so if you go to the ACT Network website, which I can put in the chat once I'm done talking, <laughs> um, you can find a link to that. And I will also send out an email later today with where to find that. Please send that around to your student. We have um, at least $500 to spend to donate to for a conference. Um, so Maracuse has agreed to match up to $1,000 and we had a $500 contribution. So if there's anyone else out there that's willing or wanting to get involved and donate, just reach out and we can add that into our total pool. I believe last year we awarded two $1,000 scholarships. So it's really great. And um, it gave a chance, you know, for these students to travel and go to attend a conference and present their work. Um, so the deadline for that will be February 15th. And like I said, I will send those out later today and I'll put some stuff in the chat. Um, and as Matt mentioned in the beginning, we're gonna, we're planning an in-person meeting, uh, hopefully later this spring, early summer, so that we can all get together and meet each other, see each other in person. And we're gonna try to hopefully get on a sort of a schedule where we're gonna do two meetings a year, you know, an in-person at some point and then an in-person later in the fall just so we can continue, you know, collaborating and catching up with each other. Next slide, Matt. Uh, and this is just some contact info. Most of you already know how to get a hold of me, um, but that's Matt's email and Beth's email. Um, but also you can just get a hold of me and I can pass things along. And that is all I have. Yeah, great. Thanks, Kim and Beth. Um, and we there's just a, a little reminder at the bottom that we we do have a social media presence on X for those who are still using it and want us to amplify their work. Uh, feel free to tag us and we'll help uh, amplify your message. Great. Um, and I think our our last update um, in this uh, beginning update session is uh, Jordan Katz, who's from the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative. Hey, everyone. 
Uh, like Matt said, my name is Jordan Katz, and I'm a contractor with NOAA Fisheries, also serving as the Protected Fish Subcommittee Lead for the RWSC. Uh, Matt Ogren, who you guys all know here today, is a member of the subcommittee. I just wanted to thank Matt and his team for giving us a few minutes of time during this meeting today. You can go ahead. Thanks. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, the RWSC was cooperatively established and is led by federal agencies, states, ENGOs, and the offshore wind industry to support research and monitoring on wildlife and offshore wind. The first order of business was to create a science plan that identified research recommendations. This plan will be released in just a few days on the 25th. Um, we're jumping right into its implementation and both the sea turtle and protected fish species subcommittees have identified acoustic telemetry as a key tool in support of environmental monitoring for offshore wind. Um, we've all recognized the need for additional coordination and hope to determine ways to facilitate regional collaborative offshore wind research. Um, so both subcommittees have decided to meet jointly on February 15th, 2024 to kick off this work with our partners. Um, we really want to stress to this group that we're not reinventing the wheel here. Um, ACT, ATN, the regional nodes, partners, and many other groups have been working with acoustic telemetry data successfully for ages. Um, we just want to work with them, work a lot with Beth, and build on these existing frameworks to make them specifically suitable uh, for regional offshore wind research and analysis. So the specific goals of this initial session are to hear perspectives from partners about the challenges, the needs, and opportunities for regional collaboration with respect to acoustic telemetry and offshore wind research, as well as how this may differ between fish and sea turtles. Um, we're also hoping to identify discrete actions for RWSC, ROSA, ACT, and other partners to facilitate this regional collaboration. We have heard stated interest in development of best practices for this method and hope to develop data products that include areas of interest for offshore wind research um, that can address key offshore wind research questions. We also hope to support a shared internal map of receiver deployments um, for offshore wind with essential metadata to aid in regional offshore wind research and analysis. And then here's a very bare bones uh, draft of our workshop agenda. Um, there will first be an introduction from RWSC who also discussed the coordinated PAM deployment, followed by Rosa to speak on highly migratory fish research using acoustic telemetry. And then the next section will focus on acoustic telemetry data collection concerns and needs. Various topics and taxa will be covered with presentations from a lot of people on this call, um, Jeff Nebone, Keith Dunton, Kim Durham, Kara Dodge and Charlie Innes, and Emily Hardin and Mar Mariana Fuentes. The next section will focus on data management and data products with focus on collaboration needs and opportunities. We will hear from Joy Young with Fact and Sakura. Ed Lavender with the University of St. Andrews and Cream, and lastly, Matt Ogburn um, with the Smithsonian Environmental, Environmental Research Center. So each sec section has a set of guiding questions. There will be, of course, time for Q&A, and we'll conclude with a group discussion regarding the workshop goals and next steps. So as you can tell, this is a really jam-packed agenda for this meeting on February 15th. And just in conclusion, if you're interested in attending the workshop or just staying up to date with all things RWSC, you can do so at the RWSC website, which is there on the slide. Um, feel free to reach out to Sue, Emily, or I for more information. And thank you all for your time. Great. Thanks, Jordan.